My name is Jeremy Holt. I'm a solicitor specialising in data protection and I'm going to talk today about GDPR and what's been happening over the length of time since GDPR came into operation uh, just under a couple of years ago. I'll talk about the consequences, I'll talk about data breaches and I'll talk about subject access requests because I find that people are often quite confused about data protection and they appreciate some kind of guidance in order to comply with the requirements. I'm a solicitor and my social life is so bad I really find data protection quite interesting and I have been involved in data protection since it started. Now it started in this country in 1984 and I always thought that was appropriate because of George Orwell's book um, 1984 which is about <clears throat> a totalitarian society where there's very little freedom, it's all under the control of a single uh, individual and life is quite grey. Uh, so perhaps it's not without significance that 1984 was also the year in which I got married. So the, it began with the 1984 Data Protection Act, which came into force in 1985, uh, about a year later. Now, the idea of data protection is a bit like the Vikings. It came south from Scandinavia. And during the 50s and 60s, it was felt that the arrival of computers gave an imbalance to the rights of those operating the computers and the rights of individuals whose information was being kept on those computers. Scandinavia led the way in having data protection legislation. And our own data protection legislation, as I say, started in 1984. That was followed up later by the 1998 Data Protection Act. And uh, that now we have got GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, and we've also got the Data Protection Act 2018. So that's the legislative background. In the notes that I have handed out, there is a page, they're not numbered, but there is a little diagram or a chart called What is Data Protection? And some people find it quite difficult to actually understand what it is that we're talking about. So, if you look at the chart, and on the left, in the middle, is something that's labelled data subject. Now, data protection, because this is the scene setting stuff, and now I'll, I'll then go on to what's been happening over the last year. Data protection is about information about living individuals, and that applies to everyone in the world. A bushman in the Kalahari is protected by GDPR uh, there, but only once uh, the controller is actually within, uh, within Europe. So the data subject is the individual about whom somebody else has information, either in a, in a, on a computer or in written records. Now, if I just take a common or garden example, my wife and I are members of the National Trust and have been since we got married, which, like all uh, good organisations, has its headquarters centred in Swindon. Um, so my wife and I have voluntarily given our information to the National Trust, and so they are the data controller. Now, I have a suspicion that the National Trust do not keep their membership records on their own servers there. I suspect they probably keep them up in the cloud. So the company providing the cloud services, that company will be the data processor. Now the difference between the data processor and the data controller is that the data controller has a long-term interest in the data. They do, because my wife and I have been members for more than 30 years. The data processor has no long-term interest in the information. On most data processing contracts I've seen, the data processor says that they'll keep the information that the data controller has given them during the agreement and for three months afterwards, but after 90 days they reserve the right to delete that data because they don't want the responsibilities that go with holding that data later. So the data processor is somebody who acts on the instruction of the data controller, they have, they're a hired hand, they've just been brought in to process the data, uh, and they, 
they're not interested in the relationship with the data subject or anything like that. Now, what isn't in this chart is that if you go north of the data processor, there could be a data sub-processor and then a data sub-sub-processor, which will happen if the cloud company transfers the information on to, say, a, storage, uh, a data storage company, and they may transfer it on. So there could be a whole chain of sub-processors going northwards that link up with the data processor, who links up with the controller, who then links up with the data subject. So there has to be a written contract between the data controller and the data processor. That is always the case, even before GDPR. <clears throat> now, the data controller may send the information, if you go up 45 degrees, top right-hand corner, to a third party. Now, I can imagine that the National Trust probably works hand in glove with English Heritage, or whatever they're called nowadays, uh, Heritage England, or Heritage of the Wake, or whatever. Um, so, so they may share information with other people. They should really let me know that they are doing that. Uh, but I probably wouldn't be too worried if it was somebody reasonably responsible like English Heritage. So there may be a data sharing contract between the data controller and the third party there. Now it's always been the case that the data controller should have appropriate security around the data. So that's, 90, you know, that's horizontally to the right hand part of the chart. That's, that was the case before GDPR. Now the data controller, the National Trust, based in England, is subject to a civil servant whose job it is to enforce data protection legislation in this country. Uh, now, that used to be called the Data Protection Registrar, but that uh, individual is now called the Information Commissioner. So it used to be the Data Protection Registrar, now it's called the Information Commissioner. She is a Canadian, she was formerly the Information Commissioner for the province of British Columbia in Canada. Um, but overall, I think she's quite a good egg. She writes uh, uh, quite a good blog. I mean, she's obviously had her, in, her very, um, her entry full over the last couple of years was with what's been uh, going on. Now, each of the European Union countries have their own supervisory authority. Now, I haven't come to tell you my views about Brexit, that's not what you're all here for. But if we do leave the European Union, it's going to cause quite a lot of problems in relation to data protection. I'll come back to that later. And if we have a no deal Brexit, it is going to cause enormous problems um, with uh, data protection. And because we are English speaking and because we are British, we have the largest data processing uh, business in the European Union by far. Um, and that may be prejudiced by particularly no deal uh, Brexit. Bit of personal background, I was run up many years ago wanting, uh, where they, they wanted me to, they asked me whether I was interested in being the next, uh, in that case it was data protection registrar. Um, I wasn't, I was quite happy doing the job that I was doing at that point. And the other thing was I would have had to have gone and worked in Wilmslow which apparently is near Manchester, and which apparently people tell me is footballers' wives' country uh, up there. So that was another reason why uh, I didn't particularly wish to go there. Now, if you go south... Jeremy, yeah. you have a question. Oh, right, sorry, where, where is the... Okay, right. You don't know where Wilmslow is either. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I see what I can do. Sorry, a question. The information commissioner, yeah. does that... Is that a role just supervising GDPR, and, or is it a wider role than GDPR is one of the responsibilities? It, 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 it is slightly wider. It's wider than GDPR because it covers the whole of data protection, okay. and not just GDPR. And it's also wider than that because she also covers freedom of information. Okay. Uh, so she is appointed directly. Uh, we've had some good uh, information uh, commissioners. I've been to conferences where she's uh, spoken um, her heart's in the right place, and I've had quite a lot of dealings with the Information Commissioner's Office. They're, they're recruiting like mad because they've got an enormous job to do. Uh, they are massively understaffed, massively, massively understaffed. So therefore, uh, any idea that they're out there trying to 
chase everybody and fine everybody. They haven't got the resources to do that. They have told me that they would much prefer the carrot rather than the stick, because it, it costs them a lot of money to chase people. And when people get fined, they don't get the money. The money goes straight into the exchequer. Uh, they get the money that you pay to register each year that you have to do, to do with that. But it is a myth to think that they recover. Um, they, they keep the, the, any fines that they have levied. There have been a couple of large fines already, as you probably know, with Marriott Hotels and with British Airways. Does that sufficiently cover? Yes. I've got some good news for you. Well, I've got some news for you. It's probably more accurate. You're in the lead at the moment. Okay. <laughs> right. Okay. Make of that what you wish. Okay. So, moving on. If you go south from the data controller, um, it says eventual destruction of data. Now, this has always been the case. You can't keep personal data forever. Um, and I often get asked as a lawyer, how long should we keep this personal data for? So, I, uh, I'll give you a couple of examples from my own law firm. If you are misguided enough to apply for a job at my firm, but you are lucky enough not to get the job, we destroy your data after about three months, because that's the probationary period for the person who did get the job, and if they completely screwed up and we find them at the probationary period, we might get back to the other candidates and say, you know, we said we didn't like you, but we've changed our mind now. So we keep the uh, information for about three or four months. But after that time, I don't think that we have got any uh, real justification for holding on to that data. If you are unlucky enough to get a job with us, we obviously keep your personal data whilst you are employed with us, and we get rid of that personal data six years after you have left us. And that's because uh, six years is the limitation period for bringing a simple contract claim. Six years is how far the tax authorities can go back um, in the absence of fraud. So we keep the records for six years to show that we paid the appropriate amount of tax and the money that we paid the individual. And if the individual at any time over the next six years came back and say, you didn't pay us um, the uh, amount of money that you should have paid us, well, we need the records to be able to show that. So we think six years is an appropriate period to do it. But we do have uh, a time for the eventual destruction of data to do with our staff. So far as client files are concerned, we generally destroy those after about 12 or 14, 13 years because the limitation period for a document under seal, a deed in other words, is 12 years uh, in the case there's any argument about the enforceability there. Then finally, bottom left-hand corner, third-party, e.g. list broker. Now, list broking, information list broking, you know, selling information about individuals, is the 21st century equivalent of horse trading in the 19th, 18th and 19th century. So GDPR has made the selling of personal data a lot more difficult uh, than it used to be. And um, I've had to look at some very, very shady uh, arrangements involving the selling on of personal data uh, where no warranties would be given and goodness knows where, uh, where they got this information. Now, I changed my email address about 14 years ago from Jeremy H at clarkholt.co.uk to Jeremy H at clarkholt.com. Now, I still get a lot of emails addressed to Jeremy H at clarkholt.co.uk, which means that it, that information is at least 14 years old, and so it's still being sold to diverse people. So that just shows how far um, uh, some of the information that's being sold, how out of date uh, that is. Now, it's been a lot to take in to start with. Has, uh, has, anyone, got, uh, has anyone got any questions about anything I've said so far? I've got an observation. So it was at a conference, the EPL conference, uh, a few months ago. And the list providers that were there, and there's yeah. quite a few of them, it's, <laughs> it's quite, quite fascinating. You had a large group that were still trying to work out whether they could legally carry on with their business model. I'm not surprised. And there's some lovely questions, particularly to the ICO there, and the lawyers when they're on the stage, and, and the answers were always, no, you can't do that. <laughs> no, you can't do that. Yeah. But heartening to see uh, was, there are actually a few what I call new breed. Yeah. 
So they actually set out to purposely build lists with explicitly given permission. Yep. And the package you bought from them was that, you know, here's a list of people who've given their permission to have marketing material about lawnmowers yep. sent to them, or garden materials, whatever. So it's explicit. And so not only do you get the, the mailing list and things, you get the provenance of the data yep. and the validity period for yep. it and so on. And that, that was, and the really nice thing is that some of them were also, for giving that permission, they were offering rewards yep. to data subjects. Yep. So you can start to see a shift in the market there. Yep. I don't know whether you've seen that far. No, no, I have. I mean, uh, and, and more power to their elbow. That's exactly what the Information Commissioner wants them to do. It. They're cleaning up their own act. Let, let's just take my, t let's just take me as an example. It's not necessarily data protection we're talking about here. It's also under something that's called PECA, P-E-C-R, Privacy and Electronic Communications Regulations. Now, if you, you're probably all working businesses or whatever. If you want to sell your services to me, you can send, um, you can email me if you can get my email address. Uh, you're not breaking any laws by emailing me. But that's because my email address belongs to a limited company. Now, I don't actually have a personal email address, I'm that sad really, but uh, uh, if I were to have an email address, you would not be able to email my personal email address unless either I'd given you my consent or that we'd had a course of dealings in the past mm -hmm. and you'd say you sold something to me before or I contacted you and asked you for some more information. Now this is the stuff, people often think it's to do with data protection, but it's not. It's allied with data protection, but it's a separate piece of legislation. So I'll just recap, recap, you're not allowed to send unsolicited advertising material electronically, you're not allowed to do that to people's personal email addresses. So, you know, bonk, 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 at gmail.com, don't send it. Bonk, 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 Schmidt at siemens.de, yes, you can send that uh, uh, email. But also, if you're sending any kind of marketing email, you must, 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 include an unsubscribe option in the email. We have about 1,500 supporters of the Computer Museum, and every time we send out an email about, and those are all the, those have all been collected legitimately, because uh, people have given them to us when they visited the Computer Museum. When we send out a mail shot, uh, email shot, there's always an unsubscribe option. And we get about three or four people who unsubscribe, mostly because they have left the area, so they're not particularly interested in things which are going on in Swindon anymore. But we are complying with that. The same with my own law firm. If we have a particular event in the evening that we invite people to, we have quite a few talks uh, in the evenings. It's not quite similar to these, but they're never about law, because otherwise no one would come. Um, uh, whenever we send that out, there's always an unsubscribe uh, option there. OK, does that? Uh, is that a sufficient? Uh, any, any other questions before I move on? Well, you raised an interesting problem. Um, for, for example, if you if you work yourself, self-employed, or whatever, yeah, is do you just use one mail address for personal and for work? Because well, I, I did, which probably isn't very clever. Uh, you should probably have a separate uh, email address. I mean, I, you know, I get endless stuff about people trying to sell stuff to lawyers, because I'm the senior partner and they can go and look it up quite easily and you might as well start at the top and send him the person and mm -hmm. information and he can pass it down to the individual. I'm not particularly interested in that. Both my wife and I are passionate military historians and I'd be happy to receive 20 emails a day about military history, mm -hmm. but unfortunately there's not really any system I can use, so I don't want any reward to get emails about uh, military history, mm -hmm. you know, bring them on. I mean, we're we're mm -hmm. re we're really interested. Um, so I, I I wish them luck with what they're doing because the kind of um, you know if they gave me a list of saying what are these things are you really interested in? My wife's interested in gardening, but I'm not. But we're both very interested in military history. We have a room that's just completely filled with military history books, and she's doing a master's in First World War history. Uh, we're complete military history junkies. We're interested in anything to do with military mm -hmm. history. Uh, Okay, any other thoughts or comments? When G GDPR came out, there was a lot of press comment about companies who were advised that they couldn't, that they had to ask every one of their email recipient lists yeah. for, for new permission. 
That, that, yeah. And they wiped their that, that was rubbish. by that, that 90%. Was rubbish. Yeah. So what that, is the answer? That, that was rubbish because they had a legitimate interest in continuing. Consent, consent is one factor in data protection, but it's only one factor. And there are lots of other factors. One of the most important is uh, legitimate interest. So it's a mistake you have to go and get consent for everything. And if the people on the emailing list had been there for good reason, then they probably had a legitimate interest in continuing to send it to them. Now, they could go and get their consent, but it wasn't mandatory. There was, uh, there was a lot of horse medicine going around at the time when GDPR came in. Um, and there were a lot of people talking. In the country of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. So if someone stood up and said, hi, I know a lot about data protection. Come and listen to me. People believe them because they didn't know very much about it uh, uh, to start with. I mean, there are all kinds of sort of myths going around, but that seems to have stabilized a little bit. And it quite irritated me because there were some organizations where I'd had a relationship with them for a long period of time. And they suddenly said, we're not going to send you anything more um, because you haven't sent in the formal consent. Um, so yeah, you can imagine that if I'm on the phone to someone and say, I can't tell you, data protection. I sort of scream, I am a data protection expert. Tell me why you can't do this. So there you go. Don't ring me up. OK, any other questions before we move on? So just to, con just to confirm, the yeah. points you raised around um, a corporate email or personal email. Yeah. So does that mean that if I have your um, corporate email, yeah. I could pass it on to another business and they could send you email and they're not violating any regulation? Um, no. Uh, <laughs> no, because you don't have my consent to, to do that. It, it's not quite as simple as that. It's not. Okay. Also, people have the idea that anything that's up on the internet, data protection doesn't apply to it. Anything that's up on the internet, data protection does, uh, does apply to it. Um, okay, uh, any, uh, other, um, any other questions before I move on? What I really came to talk to you about was what's been happening over the last year. Uh, when GDP, GDPR came in, um, it was uh, quite poignant to me because it was the exact anniversary of my father dying. Uh, so the date was uh, quite significant uh, in this way. So each time the anniversary comes around, I, I think about it. So if you look at the notes at the front, um, I, uh, so let's go through what, I'll try and keep it, right, breaches and fines. If this was a really dull talk about data protection or GDPR, I'd start by talking about fines and say 4% of your turnover or 20 million euros, whichever is higher, you know, don't step out of doors, you might get fined and all the rest of it. Well, there have been some absolutely massive fines. British Airways have been fined, I can't remember the exact figure, about 200 million, um, I can't remember if it was euros or pounds. And the... Oh, sorry, it was pounds, wasn't it? It doesn't matter anymore. Right. <laughs> okay, all right, point taken. And also Marriott Hotels, um, they were fined, I think, about 187 uh, million. Now, what's sad about that is it couldn't possibly have cost British Airways 200 million euros of extra pounds uh, to sort out their data compliance there. So it would have been a lot cheaper for them to have just sorted it out and not appeared in the press, as opposed to appearing in the press and everybody like me quoting the fines that they had. What were the fines for? Data breaches or...? Um, being slack about information. Uh, uh, effectively, it would be. Not just data breaches, because data breaches means it sounds as if it wasn't really your fault, it was just an accident. They just weren't... They weren't uh, and plus, they'd had numerous warnings uh, before. Now, the, the ICO is not out to get everybody. They were, it's a bit like a big game hunter. They go for the biggest animals first that everybody has heard, has heard of. Um, and I've had a lot of dealings with the Information Commissioner's Office. And you get a lot of points. You get a lot of points from the Information Commissioner's Office if you have tried to do the right thing, even if you have totally cocked it up. If you have trained your staff, if you have a policy on it, if you have organized training, if you have put up pop-up reminders, if you have tried to do it, if there's a mistake and something goes wrong, it's not the end of the world. You write a letter and say, on this particular occasion, we made a mistake. Generally, our data protection compliance is quite good. And this is what we've done to, to um, uh, seek to comply with the Act. 
and we've learned from our mistake and this won't happen again and we apologize and all that kind of stuff. That's all really good. They are never going to find you in those circumstances. Uh, and I'll come back to data breaches uh, later. So breaches and fines. <coughs> the two... Um, so, so let's, let's talk about data breaches uh, first. <coughs> uh, I've just, I'll just look at my my notes. Okay, it was it was pounds. It was 183 million pounds, which is probably about 200 uh, million euros. And it was the Marriott at 99 million pounds. Uh, they're both, I think, appealing that. Uh, they'd be lucky not to get higher, higher fines there. Um, but our fines, you'll be pleased to hear, are higher than just about any of the other countries in the EU. Uh, no wonder we're leaving. Um, there was a huge one. Uh, I think on uh, Google in France of uh, 50 million euros um, uh, there, which is about 90% of all the fines that have been done across Europe now. Um, and as I said, it goes to the Exchequer, it doesn't go to the Data Protection Authority. So let's, let's talk about data breaches. Let's imagine yourself in the following situation. You get rung up by someone who is rather confused um, they're not it's not entirely clear, but it appears that there's been a, a data breach. Not only have you got the problem to deal with, but you have a sort of gut feeling that you probably have to report it somewhere to some external authority, and that there can be some huge fines. You ring up your lawyer and find he's on holiday for a week. Uh, what do you do? If you listen carefully, I'll tell you exactly what you do. If there is any threat to the rights and obligations of data subjects, you must report this data breach within 72 hours to the Information Commissioner. I'll just run through that. If there is any threat to the rights and obligations of data subjects, you must report that data breach insofar as you can give them information to the best of your ability within 72 hours to the information commission. Now, you don't need to be a member of Mensa to work out that 72 hours, if this happens on a Friday evening, your lawyer's office is not going to be open until Tuesday. So you must have reported that by Monday evening, because that's 72 hours, three days later. So perhaps, and <coughs> I worked on a case where it did happen on a Friday evening. So, <clears throat> the first thing you're likely to need is the out-of-office number of your lawyer, because you're probably going to want your lawyer to get involved in this, certainly on the first one. So, have somebody who can give you advice about that. Just email you, because you don't have a personal email. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I'm also an insomniac, so I can continue providing the service in the middle of the evening. Thank you so much for po pointing this. This person has not had a work actor I've hired for the evening. Yeah. Um, so, um, you're probably going to need some professional advice, certainly on the first one of these. The next thing is, don't rush it. Sorry, question. The word you used was threat to rights and obligations of the data subject. Yeah, that's taken directly from GDPR. What would be a, so you're saying a data subject has an obligation? No, uh, a threat. so because there's been a breach, is there, is there a risk? to some data subjects. Okay, I'll give you, I'll give you a few examples okay. about that. Uh, because what you've hit upon is a major problem for people like me, because whether you have to report it or not. And I use the words directly from GDPR, because you know I'm a cautious lawyer. I'm not putting my own gloss on it. Right, I'll give you some horror stories. HIV clinic in London closes one weekend. So the email, all the people attending the HIV clinic saying the clinic won't be open this weekend because we're repainting it. And they send it all open copy, not blind copy. So everybody who's going to the clinic finds out the other 199 people who are attending the clinic. Not good. Similarly, a little while later, gender reassignment clinic has a similar thing. And they send it all out, open copy. Now there, you've got an additional gloss on it. I don't know much about this, but I'll try and explain as much as I can. I am Jeremy Holt. If I was to transition, I don't know, I'd probably call myself Julia Holt or something. 
at the exact time when I stop calling myself Jeremy Holt and when I call myself Julia Holt is apparently quite a major issue for people who are transitioning. And you might not want your old email address being hawked around to other people who, or seen by other people, who might know you as Julia rather than Jeremy, if I can put it that way. But that isn't the worst case that I'll tell you about. You're all over 18, just having a look around. Uh, the worst case I've come across, um, how can I describe this, was a Canadian company that sold sex toys generally used by women, if I could do it that way. And what was going on is that they would be sent under brown paper cover, you know, in very detailed packaging, to somebody who would order them online. But what the person who ordered them did not know is that through the Internet of Things, this sex toy was reporting back to the people who sold it. A, how many times it was used, what intensity it was used, and the average temperature of the person who was using the sex toy. Uh, so the balloon just went up uh, in, in Canada about this, and the company got an absolutely massive uh, fine. Okay, any questions about what I've said uh, so far? Sorry, still the same question. Yeah. Um, if I am a data subject, yep. and there is, um, I'm trying to remember the exact phrasing. A threat a to the rights and obligations. A yes. threat to the so, rights and obligations. So what would be, what would be a threat to one of my obli of one of my obligations? I can understand a threat to the <coughs> obligation of the company that yep. is the data controller. Yeah. But I'm trying to understand what a threat to my yeah, so obligations it's, 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 to a, it's, a, it's a risk to the individual, okay. or a breach of the obligations to the individual, if I can ah, break it down. Right, okay, I've misunderstood the word. Okay, sorry, I, I didn't explain it very well. It's a risk to the individual, yes. or a breach of the obligations to that individual. Now, right, that's, I'm with you now. that's what the legislation says. Mm -hmm. Now, in the forums that deal with data protection, practitioners like me put up Hypothetical cases, mm. do you think this is reportable? And half the lawyers say, of course it's reportable. And half the lawyers say, of course it's not reportable. So no one really knows. And there's no standard. And lawyers, I think I mentioned earlier, are quite cautious animals. So if there's any doubt, they report. And what do you think the Information Commissioner has complained about over the last year? The over-reporting of breaches. But that was about as obvious as you know, the sun's going to rise tomorrow morning because lawyers will report it because um, they will be very cautious about it. The first one I dealt with, I didn't actually think it was reportable, but the client was hell-bent on reporting it. So I wasn't going to stand in his way if he was hell-bent on reporting it. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't going to lie down on the railway tracks and stop him reporting it. He, you know, he'd got halfway to reporting it by the time I was even brought in. Well, I certainly wasn't going to derailing, derail him from that. Surely when you report it, you have to be able to articulate what the risk is to the data subject. Um, yes, that's one of the things that you have to explain. Now, this is you, as the data controller, reporting it to the Information Commission. Now, actually, not very much happens. You report it, you might get an acknowledgement. Um, and they might come and look at it, but like most of my clients, they generally don't come and see it. End of story. Now, I can tell you, there are companies who have made a decision they're never going to report any data breach at all. Now that's not good, because if they get caught out, it's a bit like Watergate. It wasn't the original break-in that brought Nixon down, it was the cover-up about the break-in that, that, that did it. So, you know, as a lawyer, I would say to you, if you're in any doubt, report it, because you're not going to die, and then nobody's going to come around, and if you don't report it, you're the threat of any kind of whistleblower working for your organisation who can go and tip off the press, who can go and tip off the information commissioner. You have some row with some uh, you know, member of staff and they say, oh, by the way, unless you pay me the settlement figure, I think I might find my way to the information commissioner again and go report the, about the data breach you had last year that you didn't report. And they're protected because whistleblowers are protected uh, uh, in those circumstances. So if I can do it like concentric rings, a kind of penumbra around what's going on, a, if there's a data breach which has a risk to individuals or a threat or a breach of their, your obligations to them, you have to report it to the Information Commission. <clears throat> if there's a high risk, if there's a high risk, 
you have to write to the data subjects themselves, and that's when it really hurts, because you're having to write, perhaps, to your customers about this. And this idea was borrowed from the states, because they found uh, that, that was quite effective of getting companies to abide by the rules, because the last thing they wanted to do was write to all their customers about what's going on. And if you haven't got the contact details of your customers, you've got to contact them by putting adverts in newspapers and magazines. Now, which commercial company wants to do that? That's huge amounts of egg dropping down from their face. Now, I accept I haven't explained it very well, but if you, if you have a look at, um, OK, <clears throat> if you look at the, um, uh, there's, a, there's a blog called When Do Individuals Concerned Have to Be Notified? In the European Union under GDPR, if a breach is likely to result in a high risk to the rights and freedoms of individuals, those individuals must be notified directly. Generally, this is the last thing that a business wants to do because of the publicity um, there. Now, a personal data breach, it's not just somebody nicking your information. It can be the destruction, the loss, the authorization, or the alteration or the unauthorized disclosure. People think of it in terms of someone hacking in. That's the thing that everyone thinks of. And it's actually a lot wider uh, than that. How to report a breach? It's got to be done within 72 hours. That's the red one. Uh, so you've got to report it to the supervisory authority. If it was going on in France, you'd have to report it to the French one. Um, now, you may not have all the information at that point. You've just got to provide the information that you do have at that stage. And if you come into further information later, you've got to report that as well. Now, you remember that the, the chart that I had about the data processor here and the data controller if there's a security breach, the data processor does not report it to the information commissioner. It, they continue going up the chain. So if it's a data sub 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 processor, uh, they report it to the data sub processor, who reports it to the data processor. So it goes up the line to the data controller. It's only the data controller that has to report it to the information commissioner. Uh, In that example, when does the clock start ticking? the data controller? Mm -hmm. uh, when they become aware of it. Okay, so Which logically must be the case, because they might find out there's been a data breach themselves, yeah. or they might be told it by a data processor. It starts when they're told it by the data processor. So there might be quite a lag, because in the contracts, as you go down the data processing contracts, often they require it to, you to report it within 24 hours. I'd, if I was acting for a data processor, I'd accept you've got to report it to the to the next one up the line in 24 hours. Mm -hmm. And then the one at the top of the queue has got 72 hours yeah. to investigate it, perhaps go and ask the information. Mm -hmm. but it's quite important that the data breach will always be reported by the data controller to the information commissioner. All the processors just pass it to the next one up the line until it actually gets to the data uh, uh, controller. How long have you seen those chains of processor, processor, processor get? Good question. I've seen chains of at least four or five, and there's probably a lot longer than that. It's a bit like a supply chain in, uh, in many ways. Because National Trust, cloud company, storage company, backup for the storage company, I mean, that's four straight away. Uh, well, that's, that, yeah, <coughs> that's four links at that point. Would, would the ICO look at the nature of your contracts? Yes. Yes. Because if you said you have to report the data breach to us within two years in the contract, the ICO would say you're That's systematically trying to avoid your obligations, <laughs> so we're not happy with it. Yeah, yeah, they would. Yeah. They would. Um, okay. there. So all of the, if you can try and think of a letter, don't worry, that's already been sealed off. Uh, there. It's not, uh, I mean, you could try but no cigar is all, is all I can tell you. Does that, make, does that make it reasonably clear? Now, <clears throat> a lot of the notes that I've given you is about, uh, just to recap about personal data. Personal data is information about living individuals. Um, it's not necessarily the names, because let's say you had some information about a solicitor who works in Swindon, who's over six foot three, and is married to a doctor. You, I can tell you now, you can work out who that is, that is me. Um, 
because uh, there are only a few solicitors who are married to doctors in Swindon, and none of them are my height. Um, so it's not necessarily the names. There's a big question about whether car registration numbers are his personal data. I don't think they are until you actually get the information about the owner of the car. Once the car registration number is linked with the owner of the car, which you can do from the DVLA, in my view, that is when that becomes personal data. So just collecting car number plates and just to the street and bring them down, that would not be uh, uh, personal data. Um, okay, any other questions before I uh, move on? What about photographs? Photographs, in the pho well, um, uh, sadly, you don't seem to have used my photograph <laughs> in the publicity for that meeting. Uh, I wonder why. Well, in case you're wondering what I look like, that's what I look like. There's a picture of me uh, in the notes. Perhaps you begin to understand why they didn't use it in the uh, publicity for this meeting. So that is personal data, because if you showed that to people in Swindon, they would say, that's Jeremy Holt. So um, photographs and films, CCTV film footage is personal data. And if you're wondering, that's why all the notices appear on walls saying CTV be in operation. That's in order to comply with the data protection requirements that you warn people that you are collecting that data. Now, you know, we have plastered the outside of my own office building with CCTV in operation to different places where we haven't got CCTV. And in the computer museum, we have lots of signs saying CCTV in operation. Um, so it doesn't necessarily mean you have got CCTV there because it's quite an effective way of getting people to uh, behave if they think they are being filmed. You know, so what about, because I'm from the education sector, what about if uh, CCTV cameras are inside the organization? So still they have to yeah. inform students yeah. that there is a yeah, yeah. CCTV camera. Yeah, there's no difference. I mean, students are data subjects yeah. uh, in that way. You're not. A, uh, you should make it clear that um, there is CCTV in, in operation. If you go, you know, we had various bits of CCTV installed outside our office and when they installed us installed it they put signs up saying ctv in operation now initially i used to think that just made it more effective but i now realize they're actually complying with the law because they're warning the people that walk past that we are collecting their personal data we don't know who they are we haven't, we haven't collected their names but it's still personal data because the pictures of them in the film is, per is personal data until until we work what about inside the corridor or somewhere? It's I don't think I, 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 it wouldn't make any difference whether it was outside the building or inside the building. You've still got to uh, uh, warn people. Because if they came through the back door and they were walking around internally, you wouldn't have warned them if they hadn't come past the sign uh, that was near, near, near the front door. Mm. You've got to make reasonable efforts. You don't have to sort of, uh, yeah. as long as you put some signs up, I think it would be uh, uh, reasonable. Your justification would be. For the, uh, <clears throat> I'll let you into a secret. If you ever want to justify it, if you can get health and safety involved, just just argue health and safety. All else fails, argue health and safety. Uh, and so, if anybody queries it, so health and safety. But that's a kind of get out of jail uh, free card uh, justification. So, if you want to put trackers in your staff's cars, say it's to do with health and safety, so they're not speeding and we know where they are. They black out when they're driving, we can go retrieve them. All that kind of stuff. There you go, it's a free leave of advice for absolutely nothing. I don't have to pay to come here. They might have to pay to get out. <laughs> pay to come here. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, so uh, the personal data, the sensitive personal data, yeah. are there some more, any stringent uh, regulation within the GDPR for the sensitive company? Yes, yes, spot on. I'm, I'm glad you raised that subject. There is a particular I haven't got a chart here, but imagine a sun that's about three foot in diameter. That's data, that's big data. Okay. Imagine a tiny sunspot that's less than 1% of the sun. A tiny sunspot, less than 1% of the total of the sun. That will be personal data. So you've got big data, and only a tiny fraction of the big data will be personal data. And then imagine a little tiny dot inside the sunspot little tiny dot, almost imperceptible, that will be the sensitive data. Now, when I first got involved in this, I couldn't work out why some things were personal, there was sensitive data, and some things were just personal data, because the rules are much tighter about sensitive data. But, 
I'm quite interested in history. And I realized that all the things that fell into the categories of sensitive data were all grounds under which groups of people had been um, uh, done down and uh, discriminated against in Europe over the last two or three hundred years. So it was things like sexual orientation, trade union membership, political views, things like that. And then I then realized what linked all of the stuff to do with uh, sensitive data. Now, in the definition, I think, of personal data here, I mentioned some of the new things that have come in. Uh, it now includes genetic data, because that could be another grounds for uh, discriminating uh, against the person uh, there. And the rules are much tighter. You have to get, get specific personal consent. So when I'm talking to clients about things, if there's a contract, I say, is there any, is there any personal data going back to forwards? And I'm often surprised at how little personal data there is. They say, oh, no, there's no personal data going through. Now, if there's any sensitive personal data going through, I've got to completely rewrite the contract at that point. So my advice to clients is don't collect personal uh, sensitive data unless you absolutely have to. Mm -hmm. No, we collect, right, I, I've got about 25 staff. Now, we have to collect, when people join us, one of the questions we ask them is, up to now, we have never asked you any medical information at all, partly because we don't want, uh, it's not relevant, uh, and we don't want to be accused of not having given you the job because, I don't know, let's take an example, you have epilepsy or something like that. When people start with us, one of the questions we ask, we say, you don't have to answer this question, but do you want to tell us any information about your medical health that would be useful for us as an employer to look after you whilst you're working for us? Now, it would be sensible for someone who had epilepsy to tell us that they had epilepsy so that we could train the people who worked around them as to what to do if they had an epileptic fit. And we might say, would you like us to let it be known amongst the staff that you have epilepsy? We won't tell them if you're not happy about that, but we think it would be a good idea quietly to tell them and quietly to tell them what they'd have to do if you have an epileptic fit in the office. Now, that's, I don't want to collect that information, but I think I should do that as a responsible employer. So I collect that information. I don't collect the information about the sexual orientation of my staff because I don't need to collect that information. What they get up to two weekends or whatever is totally their own business and I've got no need to collect that. So my strong advice to you is don't collect sensitive data unless there is a very, very good reason for doing so and very, very good reason would include health and safety aspects, as I, as I gave an example there. Does that give you a sort of sense? I, I mean, the other thing is, I have no idea, uh, amongst our 25 staff, who are, who are and who are not members of trade unions. I don't really care. I mean, perhaps if a particular trade union went on strike and four of the members of my staff said they're members of the TGWU and they're going on strike, well, I'd probably find out at that point. But up to that point, I don't need to know. And I don't, I don't want to know. I, I, don't, I don't want to know that. What I do in relation to, uh, I mean, I also handle the external benefit side of the firm. Um, but I try to avoid even collecting the medical information there. And if I have to forward something to the broker, I ask the members of staff to give me the information in a sealed envelope. And I will pass that information on to the broker who's dealing with the claim without my seeing it, because I don't need to know uh, there. So there are ways of avoiding actually receiving the information. If it's completely sealed, and it comes into you sealed, and it leaves you sealed, and you never became aware of it, then you don't have any responsibilities about that, uh, uh, about that data. Any, any other questions? I've done quite a challenging act. I worked with one, a community interest company that runs um, preschool and after school uh, what do you call clubs? Yeah. yeah. So you drop off your kids early or whatever. Yeah. Um, but they they do need to know information to safely look after them, like the, anything that might harm them, like allergies, those sorts yeah. of things. Yeah. They do need to know these things. Yeah. 
so they had to ask. And they, they've come up, I think they used the actual, it's really the sealed envelope, I think, occurred to them. The problem is they actually need people to know before something happens, exactly. so they don't have the output to go and find the data. Yeah. They need to ask him, yes. Yeah. No, I think that's, that's a good example so, of when they need to know. Yeah. They can't force the parents to reveal it, yeah. but if the parents don't reveal it, it's a bit like not getting vaccinated. You can't force the parents to have the vaccination. Yes. But you've got to understand, if you don't have the vaccination and your child dies, you're going to feel pretty bad about yeah. it. You know. So the bigger yeah. risk to the, the company is not asking the question if, the, if people lie or they don't tell them. Well, the biggest risk to the company is keeping that data after the child has left the class. Yes. The biggest, uh, uh, another big risk is somehow that leaks out to the local newspapers. Uh, somebody starts yeah. talking about it in a pub that uh, yes. isn't it surprising that all these three brothers have got epilepsy or something. Yes. So yeah. there's, you get, you, you having know. got this sensitive information, it should be restricted to those who need yeah. to know about it. And the people who do know about it should be trained and warned that if they bring, breach confidence about it, they're going to get fired. Yes. And that, I mean, actually, that, that after hours one is a good example because I know a certain medical secretary who would definitely lose her job if any of her patients find out. And that's she quite right, in my view. I mean, that is, that is, that, uh, I, uh, you know, I often used to do the induction for new members of staff, and I used to say, people are paying us substantial amounts of money for legal advice, and part of what they're paying for us is us to keep shop about what it is that we're doing. Yes. Because it's a bit like the keystone on an arch. I always said there might be one tiny bit of information that you give away, or the person might be bluffing that they know the other thing, but that keystone links what they already know, that yes. either X, Y, Z was attending a meeting with Jeremy last Thursday. No, Thursday was it? Yeah, he went straight from that other meeting because it was a bit of a risk. Oh yeah, Jeremy's family does takeovers. I wonder if he's selling his company. Uh, so they wander around and say, oh, you know, how's the sale of X, Y, Z's company going? Says, oh, how do you know about that? Well, that's real straight away. Yes, that's uh, true. Quite often, people have tried bluff on with me, and I've just played shot. Yeah. Later, they've discovered I knew all about it. Mm. And they said, You passed it, Jeremy. You knew all about it. You pretended you knew nothing at all. Well, I wasn't born yesterday. That's my job to keep. I also come from a military background, so uh, keeping shot is, is uh, unless they need to know. And I also say to the members of staff, I don't want you worrying in bed, lying in bed at night, worrying about you having said something to someone. Just keep your mouth shut. If you're in doubt, don't say anything. You can never be wrong not to say anything. Uh, that's one thing. We're also pretty tough about people who make mistakes. We don't mind if people make mistakes. We don't mind if people make mistakes. But if they didn't own up to those mistakes immediately, we fire them. And I can give you a long list of people we fired because they didn't own up to their mistakes because we need to be able to tighten it up. And they're fine. Sorry. That's the, the, the original data protection right? was uh, working for the life company, I suffered a bit from a junior age members of staff who got access to information about BRP celebrities because there seems, uh, be yeah. yeah. there seems to be this perception because someone's a celebrity or well known for whatever reason, yeah. data protection doesn't apply. Yeah. Yeah. I worked on a case where someone got fired for looking at Robbie Williams' bank statement. And it was, it was the actual, yeah, it's the, it's this, this was the transition from manual records. I discovered how the manual system worked. Right. Because everything was, Manual records, exact, all this applies yeah. to manual records. But they had a brilliant system. They, they had this, it's all in a big warehouse, and you had to put in paper requests to get access to <laughs> And the people who actually ran the warehouse, if they got multiple requests for something, they did send it, but they sent it back to the manager. Yeah, very good. Then lock the records in their safe and call in all the people and ask them why they were all asked. Yeah, for it. yeah. And yeah. normally it's when someone became, became aware that one of our customers was a. a yeah. When you put an electronic system, that access is instant. Yeah. And but you you could. Uh, I I can remember being in a so restaurant. You had to put much stronger discipline around the staff. So yeah. But yeah. you could also. You could also screen it so that any people of above a certain level. Yes. I mean, I can, I can remember being in a restaurant in London when Sherry Blair was pregnant with her mm. child when uh, and Tony Blair was Prime Minister. And I can remember listening to a nurse saying, 
oh, we, you know, she was in our hospital, so I immediately went to go and have a look at her medical records, and they'd been blocked, and we couldn't see them. Mm. And I, th I thought, well, you know, well, that's poor, poor, poor woman, you know, her medical records just shouldn't be available to any nurse who, who decides she wants yeah. to go and have a look at it. You know, I was actually quite shocked that this person was doing it. But she thought it was really unfair that they'd blocked access to Sherry Blair's. There was no reason for it. She wasn't treating yeah. uh, Sherry Blair. I'm not a great fan of Sherry Blair, but in this case, I'm very much on her side. Uh, yeah. so that, that was she, a, hopefully she's not watching this programme, Sherry yeah. Blair. Yeah. But that was a psychological problem to do with the, you know, the perception that somehow, because people are in the public eye, they the well, it's, it's, it's a bit like personal data that's up on the internet. It doesn't mean it's not personal data or yeah. data protection doesn't still apply to it. Any other questions before I move on to subject access requests? Okay. Subject access requests, otherwise known as SARs, and that doesn't stand for search and rescue. There is a section on this at the very end of the notes which I've uh, handed out. So let's deal with that. Uh, yes, subject access requests. Um, right, if you get a subject access request, this is the checklist you have to go through. Is it from an individual? You know, is it from an individual? Because I can, uh, you can't put one in on behalf of Jeremy Holt unless I've given you a power of attorney. So if you're asking information about Jeremy Holt, I don't want that information released to you simply because you put a subject. So you can only put, the idea is that you can approach anybody, you can approach any organisation and say, do you hold any personal data about me? Now, I am trying to avoid using Facebook. I don't have a Facebook account, uh, and yet I'm told by people far cleverer than me that were I to make a subject access request to Facebook, they probably have 2,000 pieces of information to me. Now, the reason why I've never made a subject access request, I probably should because I lecture about it, is that nobody has annoyed me enough for me to do this. Although great Western trains have come within a, a, a smidgen of my sending the managing director a subject access request. So is it from an individual? Because this only relates to individual, personal data about the individual. Is it about themselves? Is it in writing? You don't have to answer a subject access request unless it's in writing. So if they ring up, they say, I'm sorry, our system is such that we don't respond unless it's in writing. Now, if you're not certain whether they are who they say they are, it is legitimate for you to ask them for confirmatory evidence, a copy of their passport, a copy of you know anything that actually shows who they are, because it's, not, it's quite it's not unknown for people to make subject access requests in somebody else's name because they want to get the information back to the celebrity uh, idea. Does it make it clear it's a subject access request? They don't have to use the word subject access request. That's just the global term. But are they asking uh, for it? Um, and are we certain that they are who they say they are? Um, <clears throat> right. The first thing is do not do an Arthur Anderson. Do not destroy any data. Some people seem to think when they get a subject access request, let's destroy all the data about the individual. Then we can say, sorry, we haven't got a thing about you. If you have destroyed the data after you've received the subject access request, that is a very serious matter. The next thing is, can you actually search your own records for whatever information you hold about that individual. Either you hold information about that individual, or you don't. It may be you search all the records and you have no information about that individual, in which case you can go back and say, we've searched our records, we have no information about you. But if you have got some, <coughs> you've got to be able to produce it. <coughs> now, the information you have could possibly contain confidential information about other people. In which case, if it does, you have to redact that black pen. Uh, Are there uh, practical limits on the expectations of how far you search? I mean, I asked for context when I worked at the Prudential, they're an old company, and they've got quite a lot of what you call lost funds, where the fund is still held in trust. Someone died you know, 50 years ago. Yeah. You've still got all the paper files and everything, yeah. but uh, we can't use the money ourselves. Yeah. Um, but it's it's just sitting there, and we to actually go back to some of the really old stuff yeah. would involve trawling warehouses full of information. Yeah, it's it's a balance. <coughs> the Information Commission is quite tough about that because they think if you can go and search it, you should, yeah. unless it would be prohibitively expensive, mm -hmm. say a million pounds to searching each 
warehouse. If, it, if it's absolutely prohibitively expensive, you don't have to do it. But if it's if it, because they say your system should be such that they should be searchable uh, to see if anybody's got uh, individual records there. Now, one quite good tip is if somebody sends a subject access request in, <coughs> you have 30 days to respond. It used to be 40 days, but it's now 30 days. You can go back and say, dear Mr. A, thank you so much for your uh, subject access request. We can provide you with the information that you want quicker if you were to refine what it was that you want to know. Because it may be that uh, Mr. A only wants you know, any kind of records going back to uh, 2015, about something that was going on in 2015. So you, you say, we recognize you're right and we are carrying this out. But if you were to refine your search, we could probably give you the information a lot quicker than we would if we had to search everything. Now, Mr. A doesn't have to respond. I mean, Mr. A doesn't respond at all, even they have got to go search everything. But quite often, people don't think about refining the search. So it's okay for the person who received it to go back and say, um, you know, let, help us, we'll search for it. We can put more effort into it, we can do it quicker if you give us some kind of uh, uh, idea. Now there are some exemptions. Uh, most of them are sort of fairly obvious if you think about it. Um, and it's a right to information. It's not a right to the documents. So you can extract the information from the documents. It doesn't mean they can look at every email that's ever had that name in it. There's a, there's a myth about that. Um, and in addition, in addition to the actual information, and they really are pretty hard, these kind of things. I've worked with various clients and I've been surprised at how difficult it's been. You also have to tell the data subject the reason why you held that data. Who had received it outside your organization and how you actually got that information to start with. So you've got to tell them the source, the recipients, and why you held it. And you've got to do that in addition to actually giving them the information. I could give you lots of examples like this. My father was a naval officer, and he had a friend who was the captain of a small ship, but he never became a captain of a big ship. And he used the Data Protection Act to go and find out what senior naval officers had given as a reference about this chap, as to why he never became a, a, a captain of a big ship, a special small ship. So that wasn't my father. It was a friend of my father. Uh, but in my opinion, the, the friend of my father would never tell him who he was, who, who actually let it down. But I thought it was quite a novel use of the uh, Data Protection Act to, to, to go and uh, uh, do it. Now, one other thing, warning I'll give you, is the GDPR is a bedrock regulation across the European. There's nothing to stop the individual countries in the European Union having stricter rules than GDPR. And two of the countries that have much stricter rules than GDPR about, the, uh, about personal data are Germany and Austria. And I used to think that that was because of the Gestapo. It's not. It's because of the Stasi. Uh, and so if there's any data going from here, we're British, so therefore we apply GDPR, we enforce it, but we don't go any further than what GDPR requires us to do. But that GDPR did require us to make quite a few changes. GDPR in Germany didn't actually require them to make many changes at all because they were already up to GDPR years before the regulation uh, came into force. So if you are transferring information around Europe, be very, very careful if you're transferring it anywhere near Germany or Austria because the rules are much stricter there. We have one information commission. In Germany, they have an information commissioner in every city and also every large town. That's how seriously they, they take it. And a lot of the cases on data protection come out of Germany. Um, yeah, now, if you are worrying about whether you've managed to give all the information to the data subject, don't worry too much because as long as you've gone through the right process. Now, what, what often happens is somebody applies to a company, give me all the information, they give them all the information. Then they say, no, that's not all the information. I'm, I'm complaining to the information commissioner. So the information commissioner then writes to the company and says, you know, Mr. A has said that you haven't released all the information. And then you write back to the information commissioner and say, how can that be? We've always had a process for this, and this is what we do when we receive a subject access request. And we acknowledged his request, and we asked him to refine it. And we have training for our staff every year about uh, uh, data protection, and we have a policy that's in place about this, and 
you know, we've checked and we've provided them with all the information. Uh, it's not true that we haven't provided them with all the information. That's generally the end of it, so far as the Information Commissioner is concerned, because what the Information Commissioner wants to check is that you have a process to deal with that, you've gone through the right process. They won't generally get beyond the process to actually check whether the process did scrape up uh, enough information. And don't forget, it also applies to photographs and film, so that can actually can be quite uh, it can be quite a bore to try and get all the film that has ever been made, uh, which includes half of subject access requests are by dissatisfied former members of staff. I can confirm that statistic. It's used as a punishment mechanism. Mm. The worst one I've ever had was an IT company in London, where somebody had left and they brought a subject access request. And uh, I said, well, this is what you need to do. And they said, well, there's only one problem, Johnny. I said, well, what's that? And I said, uh, they told me, her husband is the head of IT in our company, so we've got to use him to go and get the information to provide it to the wife. I said, well, if that's the case, that's the case. I mean, it's part of his job to deal with this. Um, so I thought it was slightly bizarre that, uh, you know, perhaps the husband and wife weren't getting on too well at that point. Uh, but I wonder whether it was a sort of conspiracy by the two of them that he wouldn't go and find new information. He'd tip her off, well, they haven't got the film. And then she'd say, but you haven't got the film. I have it on good authority. You didn't tell me the film. I don't know. In fact, it all went through quite smoothly. And that was the end of it. it that was to me just, uh, you can use it just as a punishment. You're not interested in the information at all. You're just using it to punish someone who's it, giving you a bad... It's a very good punishment if you know the company has very bad systems. Yeah. I mean, the, the cost is massive. You used to be able to charge £10. Once GDPR came in, you couldn't charge any money at all, so they're free. But there is a limit, because if you're putting it in every day, you, uh, there's a... It's been you like can't things. use it repeatedly. That's right, that's right. right. In the same way that you can't bring vexatious litigation in courts. Yeah. Um, but you could probably do it every week. You wouldn't be able to do it every day, but you could probably do it every week. Sorry, sir. What happens if I do a subject access request and I work? for McDonald's or something, and they've got CCTV in the kitchen, so I've been working there for a year. And well, first, so well, first of all, I would advise McDonald's to get rid of the CCTV cover uh, uh, film after a month. Generally, people keep it for a month in case there's any kind of thing there. But technically, they have to give you the CCTV coverage, which includes you, which has gone back over the month. How do they blank out the faces of the other people? That's what they have to do. Uh, yeah. Uh, you can do it, it's technically possible. Is it, my understanding is, the case, is that as regards consent, it is not enough to simply say, we decided that everybody didn't consent. Who, there's, there's no question of consent here. Yeah. No, consent by the other people, because you, it's no blanket, there's no blanket exemption from providing other people's personal data with your personal data. That's right. Um, you, the Durant case we talked yeah, about, yeah. It, he lost on the basis that he just decided that he wouldn't, he, he, he redacted everybody else's names. And the judge said it's not good enough, you, you've got to consider um, seek, asking permission from the other data uh, um, subjects. That's one way of doing it. I'm slightly surprised that that was the uh, approach. But if you take the CCTV, <coughs> One of the consequences of somebody receiving a subject access request, you may have remembered at the bottom, in the middle, on the chart that I showed you at the start, eventual destruction of data. Mm. Once someone has had a subject access request, they tend to take eventual destruction of data, viz. getting rid of CCTV coverage mm. after a month very seriously. Because at least they've only got a month's worth to deal with there, mm. as opposed to much longer than that. And if there's a rape or a murder, then the police, police will come around within a month. Uh, about what's going on, it would be rare for it to be. But it's perfectly the case of why I did it after, after a month. Is there an exemption to say that it's not physically possible for me to remove these other people's stuff? You, you could try that argument, but it's not likely to be greeted with much sympathy by the Information Commissioner, because if it is possible to take to bank out those faces, the other people's faces, then they say you should do them. Uh, well, that would be frame by frame with a yeah, but there are companies that could that could do that. Mm. Uh, Joe's, Joe's Cafe and Bar and 
Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. The Swindon, it's out there like. Yeah, well, they might decide to take the CCTV cover it, the cameras out after that point because it's just too much hassle. Mm. Um, the uh, one of the worst cases I came across was a company that used to reprocess mobile phones, mm. and they were wondering whether to use us as solicitors. And they went and had a kind of they invited me in for a chat, and they said, "Well, we buy these phones." We don't really want to wipe them. Have we got to wipe them before we sell them to other people? And I said, Christ, you've got to wipe them. Because there's all kinds of personal data on the phone. You know, you've received that personal data. Perhaps they should have been wiped before you got them. But you've got them in an unwiped condition. If you're going to sell them to anybody else, you're not allowed to pass that personal data on. You. They said, well, it costs money to wipe them. I said, well, you know. It's you know. business you <laughs> yeah, so, Well, exactly. I was not very happy. And they, they, yeah. they were not very happy with me. And uh, they decided not to use me. I think it was because I was speaking truth to authority at that point. But I've, I've been around long enough that I will always tell the truth, even if it means I get shown out of the building fairly rapidly. Yeah. Uh, I had a slightly odd one with Experian. They, um, they had incorrect information of me. You were allowed to get them to correct it? Yeah. Yes. So they, I asked them to do that. Uh, they then asked for evidence that I am who I am. Right, that's um, fair enough. Unfortunately, all the real evidence I could provide, like my passport, driving license, etc., didn't match the incorrect information <laughs> I had, so they refused to acknowledge. Um, that's, yeah, that's a bit self-serving. Yeah, was far it was too. They only backed down at the point at which they said, well, look, actually, if you check, I own the domain concern, and I'm just blocking experience from that domain entirely. Right. And they went, Okay. okay, then you can do that's, that's not a very that clever argument, Vic, if you're trying to correct it, because... Uh, I, not, no, I actually wanted to, I, ultimately I wanted them to, to remove me from their system. Right, well you now have the right to yeah. remove them from your system, uh, 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 so yeah. maybe that would be... Uh, but it was a, it was, it was, yeah, it was a, it was a silly situation, so... That, I mean, that's a good story, that you're trying to correct it, but they yeah. didn't recognise you because you had the incorrect meter. Yeah, I've got the same yeah. thing with... Um, that's like, a bit Franz Kafka-like. Yeah, right? one, of, one of the airlines and one of their loyalty programmes, they've recorded my um, date of birth incorrectly. But every time... I buy one to unsubscribe from their emails, but they insist I must be able to log on to their system to unsubscribe. Oh, right. To log on, one of their security questions is date of birth. <laughs> I don't know what date of birth they put in. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no. So well, but, but as, I think as I mentioned, my wife is uh, was a GP, was a doctor, she's retired now. Um, but she had a bizarre case where um, there are a lot of Gurkhas in Switzerland. And the Gurkhas have, there are three major surnames for Gurkha families. Uh, Gorin is one of them. Um, but in the old days, this is some years ago, Gurkhas did not know their date of birth. They did know what year they were born in, but they didn't know their exact date of birth. So when they joined the army, the army would just put them down as the 1st of January of that year. Mm -hmm. So with only three surnames, and everybody would be in blood down this first of January. <laughs> my, my wife got a letter to say that one of her particular patients had died. And she thought, oh, that's rather unusual. And he saw him last week. He looked a pretty fine fellow. And then he came into the surgery. And she, he was there in front of her. And she knew who he was. And then she got this official letter from the NHS and said, I'm afraid Mr. Corrin, you know, born first of January, 19, whatever, uh, has died. And she had a hell of a problem convincing the authorities that he was still alive. And it was just because they'd mixed up two, two people in that situation. I mean, you could make a film about this because if you have died, just think about what you could get up to. I mean, that really could be quite fun, couldn't it? Because you just, you don't exist anymore. How, how useful could that be? Well, you forget parking fines for a start, can't you? Um, I think somebody probably already has made a film. Yeah, well, there, there, there we go. Um, Okay, well, I've, I've rattled around for one hour and uh, 20, I've rattled around for 100 minutes so far. Um, there are other rights that you have under GDPR. Um, subject access request is one of them, but you have the right to rectify the data, which is what you talked about. You have the right to erase the data, which is what we've also touched upon there. You can restrict the processing of the data. You also have the right to say, to go to company A and say, I want all the personal data that company A has about me and transfer it to company B because, for example, I might want to switch electricity suppliers 
So you could say company A transfer it all to company B. So if I go to Google and ask them to transfer all my data to like, Microsoft. <laughs> you could do that. Yeah, that might be quite fun. Data portability. Um, uh, yeah, those are the major ones. And of course, you know, well-known murderers have already exercised their right to be forgotten. But of course, there are restrictions that prevent them from uh, uh, their, their, their crimes being remembered uh, at that point. So all the different things that you can think don't of. Don't companies, they don't have to respond to a um, request to delete data. They can sometimes say, no, we're not. We're, we're, we won't. They can, but they've got to take it and they've got to explain why, yeah. uh, which exemption. We did get one of the computer views of uh, somebody who wanted to be forgotten. Uh, but of course, we had to keep a record. We did get rid of his data, but we had to keep a record. <laughs> he sent us a request to be forgotten. So we had no information other about it other than the fact that he requested his right to be forgotten. So we still had to hold data about it. But the only information that we had was that he'd requested the right for all this data to be expunged. Um, That's inconsistent. Yes, I accept, I accept that. But what else could we do? Uh, in the same way that. Uh, well, why not? Get rid of the get rid of the data and get rid of the request to be not. Um, I don't know. I, I think it was. Uh, I think it was to. Sh I think it was to show that we had carried out his wish. It's a bit like eating your leg, where you eventually disappear. Um, we thought it was legitimate to hold uh, that he had asked for all his information to be uh, uh, deleted, which is why we deleted all that information. Is there a disproportionate? There, there is, but it's only in very extreme circumstances. People always think, oh, well, it's going to cost us a lot of money to do that. Um, uh, we're just to make the information commissioner, it's going to be quite expensive. They're pretty unforgiving about that. It would only be prohibitively. You know, mm -hmm. If you take your warehouse things, where it will literally cost millions to search every warehouse, mm -hmm. they'd probably accept that. But if it was commercially feasible to do that, because their argument is, your system should be such that you yes. should be capable of searching for anyone's name. Have you, there's a requirement for new systems to be designed with um, GDPR in mind. Exactly. And the, the, the Information Commission is very, very keen on that. If I wanted to get the Information Commissioner to my office or the Deputy mm. Information Commissioner to my office, I know how to do it. I'd write to them and say, I have a huge number of developers who are developing personal data systems and they've got no idea about data protection. What they'd really love would be some steer from the Information Commissioner's mm. office as to what systems they should build in, what, what rules they should build into their systems at the beginning in order to make subject, answering subject access requests um, easier. Uh, that would really press the hot button of the Information Commissioner. Yes. And they, they might not send the head honcho down, but they'd certainly send someone down uh, because they would be so keen to do that. They've told me. You know, that they've identified that as being something they really want it built in and sourced. Uh, and, and the obligation obviously starts when the Act came in before, so all brand new systems. Yes, exactly. If they haven't had it designed in, should have put it in. They've yeah. got a problem because one thing that's very easy for the ICO to spot is the audit system is the design. Designs can't be just changed like that. No, understood. <laughs> Code can, data can be deleted, but yeah. the design is there. And if it's systematically wrong, it's, yeah. that's when you go straight into the big fines. So new systems seem the, to be the, e, the EU's plan with GDPR, I can assure you, was roll it out in Europe, and then the rest of the world's going to have to follow it, because they can't distinguish between Europe and the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. And already other countries are starting to follow GDPR. There's equivalents of GDPR in other countries, because you know, it's a bit like if you have to give this for some of your customers, most, uh, uh, you, you can distinguish in terms of conditions mm -hmm. of sale between consumers and non-consumers. Mm -hmm. And if, uh, so when I'm drawing up terms and conditions, I say, look, you've got to give this to consumers. Do you just want to give those to consumers or should we just give them to everybody? Mm -hmm. And nine times out of 10, the clients say to me, give them to everybody because we don't know whether they're consumers or not. So if we have to give it to the subgroup Consumers, we will give it to everybody because it's just easier. And we'll just you know we'll take it down to the lowest common denominator. Yeah. Now, let's say you're moving information around and some of it goes to Europe, uh, and you're based in Singapore or you're based in Canada or you're based in South America or something. You think well, we've got to comply with GDPR 
if it goes into Europe, well, why don't we just comply with GDPR all the way around the world? And then it doesn't matter whether it's going in Europe or not, because it's going to comply with all the, uh, uh, the different uh, side. Yeah, maybe. Uh, you look at carry with the question. You know, if, as an organization, we are moving from one cloud system to another cloud system. Is it uh, uh, our right to ask one cloud system for five years or six years what data are stored, or is it organization's responsibility to remove all the data from, from say, Google to Microsoft? Just run that past me. Uh, <coughs> when you talk about one class system. Uh, so say Google Drive to Microsoft Drive. Right. Uh, as an organization. Right. Yeah. OK, they would be a data processor for you. OK. So I rather suspect that they're going to, once you've moved it, yeah. I'd rather suspect that they're going to delete that data themselves later. Later on, okay. Yeah. So they're, they're probably going to do that within 90 days. They would have no reason to hold that information long term. Okay. And they weren't born yesterday. Uh, right. So the holding of the information is going to be a headache from their point of view. Because they might get a subject access request in or something like that. Yeah. So they will, clear, they will delete that delete data. The data. Yeah. That will happen automatically. You can check that they've done that. But I'd be very, very surprised if they don't do that automatically. Okay. okay. Also, claim the right to, to get data transferred is the right for the individual. That's right. That's right. So it's only the information about the individual that gets transferred. So Which, but that's another way of looking. So at you, it. so you, so for example, you know, it's, it's like, uh, yeah, from uh, one insurance company to another, or whatever. That's right. You, you have that right. Or electricity. But store. an insurance company couldn't turn up and say, "Please move all your customers." Across. No, no, you could, you could even. It's, it's only the, the individual yeah. that, has, that has the right. Yes. Right, I've spoken for about an hour and a half. I think that's contractually what. <laughs> so, uh, any final questions before we wrap up? I'm going to be around afterwards if you want to ask me, if you don't want to ask any questions in personal uh, oh. session. So, I've I may be getting, I may have the wrong end of the stick, but I understood that GDPR applied to anyone who was based in Europe, regardless of where the processing was done. Correct. Uh, there's two aspects to that. Um, if you are, if in America you are processing data about EU systems, then GDPR applies. Yeah. And if within Europe, Within the EU, you are processing data about Kalahari Bushman. GDPR applies. So within Europe, it applies to any the processing of any data anywhere in the world. And outside the EU, it only applies to information about EU citizens. Interesting. Does that, is, is that reasonably clear? So any processing of any personal data in the EU, whoever it is, mm. GDPR applies, whether they use it or not. But if it's processing that's happening outside the EU, GDPR only applies if, if you're processing data about EU citizens. So if in India you're processing data about Indian citizens, you can do whatever you like. But if in India you're processing data about EU citizens, then you've got to comply with GDPR. I was in a course with, uh, GDPR course, with some guys from a cup, one of the largest car rental businesses in the world. Right. And it was quite fascinating, the moment where it struck when an EU citizen goes into any of their offices anywhere in the world. The world bears out my case, yeah. To hire a car, GDPR kicks in. Yeah, spot on. Yeah, <laughs> so <that>. sickening. <laughs> you do yeah. see websites nowadays that say, we're not going to display you this, you can't access this page. Yes. What account have you been? Can I just ask one specific, very yeah. specific question? What, can I sue the British Computer Society, Berkshire branch, for videoing me without my permission. For what? For videoing me without my permission. <laughs> I don't think you are being videoed. The video is only of the talk that I'm giving. Uh, but you'll have to take them up with them. I hope they get appropriate legal advice. Yeah. Right. For persistence, if nothing else, I'd like to present you with the book. <laughs> uh, and uh, <clears throat> hello, I'm, a, I'm a, not a hard man. So, also for slightly less persistence, you know, I can put for a copy there. Um, if you have been... Notice the second question is about to be remained. Yeah. If you have been, thank you very much for listening. 
And uh, thanks for the opportunity of giving the talk. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank, Thank you very so much. Yeah.